Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started um, by introducing um, the webinar. My name is Kelsey Johnson. Um, I am the product marketing manager at Smith AI. Smith AI is a virtual receptionist and chat service for businesses. Our receptionists can answer calls, chats, texts, and Facebook messages. We can transfer calls and take messages, qualify and intake new leads, book and reschedule appointments, and much more. Just a real quick update while I have everyone here, we have a couple of new features um, that I'm excited to mention to you if you haven't heard about them. Uh, the first is outbound calling directly from your call summary. So if you are a Smith AI client and you get those call summaries, you can actually click directly in that email to uh, request an outbound call in case you know somebody was missed or you need some more information or anything like that. Um, we also have a dedicated Spanish line. So if you're looking to have all of your calls answered exclusively by bilingual receptionists who are um, fluent in Spanish and English, we have that available now too. Um, and then all of that information can be found at smith.ai or feel free to reach out to me um, via email or social media. Today on this webinar, I'm really, really excited to announce that we have Ashley Kirkwood as a guest host or a, a panelist. Um, Ashley has been driving herself to succeed since she was a young law student who graduated at the top of her class at Northwestern. Her expected life path was clear, become a big time corporate lawyer helping Fortune 100 companies win in court. And she was happy to oblige for several years until she realized that that type of life was not for her. Leaving her six figure salary behind to become a full time entrepreneur, Ashley now runs a successful law firm and a legal consultancy, as well as a thriving speaking business where she presents multiple topics and custom programs to universities, corporate conferences, and TED Talks, as well as teaching other speakers how to do the same. Um, I just wanna note here that it's really, really exciting to have her uh, doing this free webinar for us um, as she almost never does these. Um, her Speak Your Way to Cash Academy is renowned for showing both burgeoning speakers and successful business owners with little speaking experience how to translate their skill and knowledge to the high paying corporate stage in person or virtual. Today, she's going to give us the inside scoop on landing these five or six figure corporate contracts, which seem elusive for small businesses, but apparently they aren't. And we don't have to wait until after the pandemic for this. This can all be done virtually. So thank you so much for being here, Ashley. And uh, please take it away. Hey, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you so very much. I'm really excited to get into this content and talk to you guys. So just so that we can get some engagement going, I'm so excited to do this with Smith.ai. They've been a huge, huge, huge help. Um, and a partner in our success and really just helped us, even though we're an emerging business, we're growing, it really makes it feel like a big business when clients call and it's like, hello, like I've actually, my parents have called my firm sometime and they're like, I have the wrong number. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 that's our answering service. They're our partners, it's totally fine. And I just love that because my clients feel well taken care of. They can always reach their attorney. And on the corporate side, they can always reach the consultant that they've hired to come in and land some of these contracts. We're going to talk about uh, you all landing. So just so that I know who's in the room, as I tell you a little bit about myself, if you all could say um, in the chat, if you are a current speaker, so you're someone who's getting paid to speak currently, or if you are not getting paid to speak currently, but you plan to do so after this webinar, put future speaker in the chat. And then let me know what kind of business you run. So law firm, consultant, just tell me a little bit about who you are, what you do. Super excited about getting this started um, and chatting with you all about some of these concepts that I think are integral to landing these five and six figure corporate speaking contracts. All right. Okay, so we're going to jump right in. You are in the right place if you intended to come to a webinar that is all about landing five and six figure corporate speaking contracts, even in a pandemic, co-hosted by Smith AI, a fabulous partner of ours, who's really brought this to life. So thank you again so much, Kelsey, for just your impeccable um, leadership and getting this off the ground. So 
that's that's what we're going to be talking about so if you all thought we were going to talk about something else <laughs> then you are not in the right place but you are welcome to stick around that is what we're talking about landing those five and six figure corporate speaking offers and we have about 45 minutes of content we're going to do a q a and i actually left room in here to do a hot seat where i will hopefully be able to take some of you off mute and get some questions live so that you're able to participate in that so if you are one of the people who want to do a hot seat with me you want to talk about your specific topic and how it can work for you and kind of see how we engage with people live right here totally unscripted <laughs> i did not plan someone in advance and make sure you're ready to go um, when we take that when that opportunity opens up so hopefully you're in the right place now you are also in the right place if you are a thought leader in any respect or an expert someone who knows their craft we're going to talk a lot about the types of topics that corporations are interested in, the types of topics that uh, colleges are interested in, because I work with both audiences, but I want you to know that if you're someone who's like, I know a very specific thing, I don't think it could ever apply to corporate, I assure you that that is more than likely not the case. I will say this, I have never met someone yet who has had a who was a, a true professional, a true expert, a thought leader, an entrepreneur that did not have a capability or a skill that corporate was interested in hearing about. So you're in the right place if you're someone with an expertise. Um, we're gonna cover the number one mistake that speakers make um, that's keeping them from booking paid engagements, specifically the number one mistake that's keeping small business owners from booking those corporate contracts, the biggest myth associated with the virtual landscape that we're in now, and then the organizations that are currently hiring. So if those are the topics that you're interested in hearing about, then just drop a yes in the comments. We are gonna keep this engagement high because look, I get it. Everyone who was in this pandemic has at some point experienced what I call Zoom fatigue, okay? But we're going to keep this Zoom chat going live and popping. So if you're with me, just drop me a yes in the comments. So first, what is my story? Who is this girl with all this energy coming to you to talk to you about this topic that a lot of people um, are, are intrigued by, or it makes things seem like a little bit of a mystery. So this is me. That's actually a picture of me, my husband, and my little girl. Um, she's eight months as of January 5th. Um, I'm an international speaker and award-winning lawyer. I use speaking to quickly scale my law firm, which is a fast-growing law firm that represents primarily seven and eight-figure brands to help them to uh, protect themselves. We have legal packages ranging from five to $15,000 per month. And we land those contracts and really partner with our clients as they scale and grow to ensure they're in compliance. But all that sounds great. But when I first started my firm, I left my $300,000 corporate salary to zero clients and zero, uh, really zero prospective clients. It was really one of those things that was like, I am done with the big law. And so I'm leaving, right? And in order on day one, when I left that job, I had to figure out how am I going to make money tomorrow? And my answer to that question was by using what I had. And what I had at that time was a book called um, The Law School Hustle. I don't even know if I have a copy of it around here, but I, I wrote a book called The Law School Hustle all about how I went from having a 2.1 GPA in undergrad to graduating top of my class at Northwestern. I transferred law schools, had a really specific study strategy that I used to reach success. And I did all that, landed a job at Kirkland and Ellis LLP. I see some lawyers on the call. If you're a lawyer, you know, you know uh, what Kirkland and Ellis is as a firm. So I worked at Kirkland and Ellis in Sidley, Austin. If you're not a lawyer, you may know Sidley because that's where Michelle and Barack Obama met, claim to fame. So that's my personal take on why I love the firm. <laughs> um, but I'm sure their take is because they're like a multi-global law firm, right? They do all these great things for clients, but really, the key is they had Barack Obama there at one point in time. So I did all that stuff, worked at a um, at a large firm, but was over the big law life, the grind, the 18 plus hour days, which was my experience as a litigator um, in the Chicago office at some of the large firms that I work with. So when I left, I started a speaking tour and I took my book and bulk sold it into law schools around the country, literally old school, just picking up the phone, calling them and booking myself to speak. And after a while I realized, oh wow, not only will they buy this book, but they'll also pay me to speak. And I just, I hit 
<laughs> I, I did it. I'm telling you, I did it the most laborious way possible. I didn't have a coach. I didn't have guidance. I just called. I called and I emailed literally over 4,000 colleges, law schools, and universities my first year and landed myself paid speaking engagements. All the while, I'm on social media to build up my firm. I'm taking CLEs. I'm hiring Smith AI and virtual assistants and administrators to help me administrate the legal clients that were going to come in in the future. But the way that I made money on day one of becoming, of being an entrepreneur was speaking. It was bulk selling that book, asking people to buy, pay me to speak. And if they didn't have the budget to pay me to speak, they bought enough books to cover my speaking fee. That was the old school way of me doing it. And now, of course, we don't have to do that. We've systematized the way that we get higher caliber clients and we sell them into higher value packages, those five and six figure offers that we're going to talk about today. But in the very beginning, that was how I did it. Can you recommend a virtual assistant firm? Oh my gosh, I, I can't. And I only can't because I think hiring a virtual assistant is the most hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I literally was talking to Kelsey about this before, before the call. What I, what I do now to hire, since it came up totally aside from what we're going to talk about, I actually hired an HR consultant um, to work with us. Instead of me hiring for each individual role and managing all of that and working with five different recruiters, I hired an HR consultant. I talked to her 30 minutes a week and then she's hiring for the seven positions that we have open. It took it all off my plate way back. She's even hiring for my personal staff, like nanny, housekeeper, personal assistant. So that's how I'm doing it now. And I found her on Upwork. So proceed at your own risk, right? I can't, I can't recommend anyone, but that's the platform that we use for that. Um, but yeah, so I'm sought after to speak at colleges and corporations around the country. The great thing about speaking for my lawyers on the, um, on the call is where we are geographically restricted in some areas, speaking is an, an area or a practice that you can grow and develop where there are no geographical restrictions. We're actually right now pitching to embassies in other countries where I'll be going in and training leaders in other countries on confidence and leadership, et cetera. So th the sky really is the limit when it comes to speaking. So keep that in mind. Um, these are some of the podcasts that you may or may not have heard or seen me on. Or if you go in your Apple podcast link, you can type in my name and find my interviews on these um, areas because speaking and developing and growing my law practice is something that I talk a lot about on shows such as these. And the, we're going to just go right into the material right now. And before I do that, I just want to read about some of the people that we have here. Lots of current speakers, some future speakers. I'm a youth and empowerment speaker. Future speaker, lawyer, I love that. First off, shout out to all the lawyers on the call. I think that society really makes lawyers believe you can only do one thing and one thing only. Accountants are the same way. But I love when you can um, take the professional services that you are trained in and utilize it in a variety of ways, especially if you're a litigator, you're a natural born speaker. And I did jury trials. So I had to keep a jury engaged. I had to convince them of my viewpoints. And that is something that has served me exceptionally well in the speaking market. So shout out to everyone who's here, super excited about the engagement that I'm seeing in the chat. So let's go with the number one mistake because some of you are actually speaking currently. Some of you are speaking currently. And so I want you to know the number one mistake that I see from speakers who are trying to, that's keeping them from booking large engagements. And here's the number one mistake. The number one mistake is they go in with a single speech. I cannot tell you how many people have come to me and said they work with other speaking coaches or they've sat down and developed out an outline for a speech. And when they go to sell that speech to a, a client, a potential client, they go in with the one speech every single time. They start off with like, hey, I'd love to come in and talk to your audience and give them my, my signature speech is called the currency of confidence. It's trademarked, it's mine. You shouldn't see anyone else using that. Let me know if you do. But the currency of confidence, they're like, I wanna sell you into the currency of confidence. I'd love to come and do this workshop. But the problem with that is, the problem with that is it limits, the, it limits who you are in the client's mind. So with that initial point of contact with your client, if you don't remember anything else, that initial point of contact sets the stage for the reoccurring revenue that you want to create with your client. And this is something that I think is a mistake of, with business owners across the board. When you first meet a client, you need to paint the biggest, the grandest picture, while being honest, of course, of what you can provide to them in that first interaction. 
even if all they do is do one engagement with you, one speech with you, um, if they buy one service from you, they have a goal of where they want to go, something that they can grow into. Now, think of it in real estate. The reason why a lot of times when you have a um, real estate agent and you watch like those, some of those real estate shows and they show, they're showing a client a house, they always start off with like the million dollar house. It's way out of budget. They know people cannot afford that house in the beginning, or they at least have told them that this is not money that they want to spend, but they still show it to them. And typically what ends up happening is they either adjust their budget or they adjust their expectations. And that is exactly what you want your clients to do on the speaking side when you are selling them into a five or six figure corporate offer. You want them to know that your traditional or your average, the average value of the packages that you sell to them is 50 to $75,000. If they want you to come in and do something at the one time level, then they're either gonna have to adjust their budget, right? or they're gonna to have to adjust their expectations. And when it comes to their budget, that may look like, all right, we can't bring you in at $75,000, but we have $15,000, what can you do? One of the things that surprises my clients the most is when you start off as a speaker with a well-developed five or six figure offer, let's just take $75,000. You have a $75,000 speaking offer. They may not be able to do all 75,000, but that 15,000, instead of it being used for five speeches or 10 speeches, you may get that entire $15,000 for a 45 minute webinar with five or six, like with an ebook that you send out to the audience. Because typically they're putting the, the ball in your court at that point. This is our budget. And we can talk a little bit about like the, cause there's a whole sales process for how you even get to that conversation. And we'll talk about how you identify the clients that are actually paying these rates and have the budgets to pay these rates. Um, yes, and congratulations on taking the February bar. Um, an associate at our firm just found out she passed the California bar. So I saw that in the comments. I just want to say that. So shout out to Solani who just passed the California bar. She's an associate at Mobile General Counsel. So we're so thrilled about that. Um, but you want to keep that in mind. So the number one mistake that I see speakers make um, going in and going out, going out, out the gate is that they come in with a teeny, teeny, tiny offer that they believe the client can afford versus going in with the ultimate offer the biggest, grandest way that they can serve the client to get the client the ultimate result and allowing the client to adjust their budget or adjust their expectations. Because I'll tell you something else, if someone knows that your average customer contract is 75,000 and you do them a solid and, and adjust to their budget of $15,000 or, or so, then they aren't thinking that you're gonna give them everything in the kitchen sink for that rate because they already know they're not coming in at your traditional client um, rate. So you wanna, you want to go in with the ultimate offer, which is why I personally am of the belief that every single speaker on the market needs a five or six figure speaking offer. You just do. And, and that may not only include speaking. That may not only include speaking. It may include coaching or consulting or some products or some other things. But the total value of that offer needs to be such that the client has room to grow into it so that you're able to achieve them the end result. And I'll tell you why. Most of the time when clients bring me in to do the currency of confidence, it's because their students are suffering from a lack of confidence. And that's playing out in the way that they aren't able to get jobs. They aren't able to network effectively. They're having some issues in different areas of their life. Okay, well, if that's why you're bringing me in, me coming in for 40 minutes one time is not going to be the thing that transforms the lives of your students. That's the hard truth. And I think a lot of speakers are afraid to just say that, but we know. <laughs> We know that if you have me come in one time for 30 to 45 minutes, that is not the single event that's going to transform their life for the long run for most students. And how do we know that? Because we've done the research and research says students are only going to remember 25% of what I say immediately after the conversation and not just students, adults too. So if that's the case and you want a real transformation, I need to work with them over time and I need to serve them in a variety of ways that'll actually get them the end result. And so if you are presenting your package in a way that is solution centric, so it's all about how can you get them the end result that they really want. And if on your sales call with them, you're co-creating a vision that they're trying to see come to pass, you're able to really help them transform. So the big mistake and the thing that none of you will do, whether we work together beyond this interview or not, is now you know, okay, 
the way that I pitch has to change. I cannot go in with a one-time offer, even if that's what the client comes to me for. Because here's the other question I get. What if they say they only want this one keynote? Then that's your job to do the digging and find out what is it that they really want. If someone is hiring you to do a keynote on any topic, I guarantee you, it is not just because they love the, the sound of your voice. Even if it's a good voice. <laughs> Even if it's a good voice, it's because there's underlying issues, people have made complaints about certain things, and what they really want is for people to be changed, and change simply takes time, repetition, and dedication, and that typically can't happen in a one-off engagement. So the great news is, if you're a speaker, if you're a consultant, if you're a lawyer, most of the people want something that you can provide, but it's your job to uncover it and to help them. I call it co-creating vision with your client. You want to be a part of that vision, and there are some fact-finding questions that you can ask to help them feel like, okay, not only not only do I need this, but you're the exact person who can give it to me because we've spent the last 30 minutes on a sales call co-creating that vision together. So that's number one. Are there any questions about anything I've said? I know I threw a lot of concepts at you and we still have more information to get through, but are there any questions just about that piece of it? Are there any questions just about that piece? So let me know. Okay, good. So it sounds like we are still rocking and rolling. So this is another big question that I get. All right, I'm bought in. I'm bought in. Okay, great. I see a question. The question is, do you suggest having more than one signature talk? Do you suggest having more than one signature talk? Um, here's my answer to that. I suggest that you do whatever, this is actually an answer that I heard um, someone give to me about when I was trying to figure out if I should have more than one offer or do something more than one time. They were like, I suggest you do whatever you can do in excellence. And what I mean by that is what can you sell in excellence? What can you deliver in excellence? And how are you able to present it to a client in excellence? Now, what I really recommend, what I really recommend is more important than a signature talk. I recommend you have a signature framework that you can base a variety of talks upon. And what do I mean by that? So the currency of confidence is a framework, essentially. It's all about the mindset, beliefs, and actions of successful insert client type here. So I can do the currency of confidence to a team of lawyers and it could all be about effective advocacy. I can do that same presentation to a team of college or to a group of college students. And it'll be all about the mindset, beliefs, and actions of successful college students. And I will just tailor my stories and my statistical data that I base the, the presentation upon to that audience. But it's not me recreating the wheel because the framework is the same, but there's nuances to each of those speeches that I can tailor. So I have two frameworks that I sell into corporations and colleges. One is the currency of confidence. The other is the love method of communication. The love method of communication is typically geared towards um, corporate audiences. And it's all about listening, open-mindedness, validation, and empathy. But I just did it for a group of um, healthcare professionals that worked at AbbVie Pharmaceuticals. We made sure all the data was very relevant to the doctors and the clients that they serve. When I do it for, for more of like a DEI presentation, I make sure that all the data and, and everything else is about that, but the framework is the same. So I think what you really need is a signature framework that you have trademarked, right? Like no one else can use. You won't see it anywhere else. You have a signature framework that you base a variety of presentations upon. That way you're able to still tailor it for the client, but you're not overworking as a speaker. Because I see, when I get a speaker sheet, before we start working together, it's like I speak on 75,000 different topics, any number of which are not unique to that individual, meaning that you're already losing <laughs> because you're commoditizing what you do. So if I were to brand myself as you know a leadership speaker, they can Google leadership speakers and everything else will come up or a variety of speakers will come up. But if they Google the currency of confidence or the love framework of communication, those are, those are uh, frameworks that are directly tied to me. So when they Google it, I'll come up. And whenever you're selling something and you don't wanna be um, commoditized, you don't wanna compete on price, which is, I do not compete on price. That is for the birds. And honestly, there's a whole business model where you do compete on price and you can still be super successful and make a ton of money. I just don't do it because I don't have the um, infrastructure 
to, to push that business model effectively. So we're not venture backed or anything like that. We're not spending $700,000 on Facebook ads. We're not in the volume business. If you're, if you're funded in a particular way though, the volume business could work. But if you're not, I think going for uh, premium offers is gonna be the way to go. So I recommend having a signature framework, maybe one, maybe two. Um, starting off, I always recommend one. I started with the currency of confidence and over time, after listening to the needs of my customer base a lot and doing market research, I developed a second one based on the needs of the market, not just because I wanted to do multiple things. So that's kind of how I recommend you approach it. Um, okay, how do you get the audience to do your pitch? April, what do you mean by that? Do you mean where do you find audiences that'll pay you to speak or do you mean um, something else? Let me know. Uh, and then how do you qualify yourself when you're just starting out based on experience versus credentials? Very, very, very good question. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So tips for tips for selecting your topic. Um, here's what I'm going to do. Um, okay. Let's talk about topic selection. Overall, I'm gonna give you the general and then I'm gonna give you a framework you can use to select what you specifically should be talking about. In general, colleges are looking for topics that are easily, um, that, that have wide appeal. So leadership, success, academic success, um, mental health and wellness. They're really looking for topics that you could essentially give to the entire university where there are diverse students within it that have all different capability types and it'll be relevant, engaging and interesting to them. Another thing about the college market, right? Colleges also want you to have high energy. If you look at college speakers, you may see them hopping on tables. You may see them jumping up and down. You may see them entering, like when I was speaking out of college, I was like entering to Lizzo and saying the, the lyrics and they're saying them back. I mean, it just took a ton of energy. But as I got older, let me tell you, okay, I was like, let me go right on over there to corporate, okay, because they don't require no jumping, no hopping, no lyrics, all right? So, so, you know, if you have the energy to compete in the college market, just know to be really successful and really make your mark, you're going to want to give a high energy presentation. Now for corporate, I still like to be engaging. I still like to have funny videos, but, you know, they're, I'm not going into these corporations and you know, quoting Lizzo and having to know all the, the latest lingo, nah, they don't care about any of that. So, so thankfully, the corporate market is more so about what are you going to get, what tools are you going to give them specifically, and can you be interesting and engaging? But the truth is, in the corporate market and in the college market too, you can get hired without being an exceptional speaker. It's just the fact of life. If you're really great at sales, you could get hired without being an exceptional speaker. I personally think though, if you want your reviews to be high and you want your partners to be happy and you want the individuals that you're talking to to ask for you to come back over and over again, you're gonna wanna make sure that your delivery is on point. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So in terms of um, corporate topics, what's really hot right now, honestly, is wellness. So if there are any therapists on the line, any life coaches, anyone that can speak to wellness and productivity in a pandemic, then you, you all are on fire. Like my clients who are therapists are crushing it right now. Life coaches are crushing it right now. People who are in productivity are crushing it. But really, wellness is hot. It's a hot, hot, hot topic. If you are someone who has had COVID, had to keep working, parent from home, like literally you've been directly impacted by the, um, the pandemic in a very serious way, then that story could help so many people in the corporate audience. Because what everyone is trying to figure out right now is just how do you survive in this new normal? And even if, because a lot of people are like, oh, you know, you have to get childcare and childcare is so expensive. But even if you can afford childcare as a new parent, I can tell you this, almost every decision feels like life and death. Like we're hiring a nanny, but it's like, ooh, should we? We're only gonna do a couple days a week. She has to wear a mask all the time. She has to get COVID tested. So what is the stress of that with the stress of also running a company and or being an employee at a company? People need help developing a framework for dealing with day-to-day -day life in a pandemic. So if you've been directly impacted, that how you've been able to overcome that and still push forward in your professional life is something that companies would be so interested in right now. And it really ties into wellness. So anything that can tie into wellness or leadership, how do you lead during um, uh, troubling times? How do, you, how do you even, for me, so the love method of communication is all about how do you have difficult conversations with your people? 
with love? How do you lead with empathy when everything you see is just so, <laughs> it can be so triggering. <laughs> like the news is literally like um, a movie now. It's not even like, you know, you used to turn on the news, you're like, oh, you know, certain things happen, but now it's like, what happened? Oh, oh my God, like everything is so dramatic. So how does that interfere and, and impact people going to work every day when literally current events are bleeding into everyday life? There used to be this thing where you could say, you know, don't bring politics to work, but now our very way of life is impacted by the political landscape. So even if you don't want to bring it to work, it's at work. It doesn't matter if you want to or not. You cannot ignore the events of the time now. So what does that mean for people at work? What does that mean for leaders? What does that mean? So you definitely want to make sure that you're thinking about your life in that sense as well. So how do you select your topic? And this goes to the question we got earlier about how do you qualify yourself when you're just starting out? How do you qualify yourself when you're just starting out based on experience versus credentials? This is a really good question, Karen. I appreciate it. Here's what I'll say. Um, and I'm gonna give, I'm gonna tell you all what fame stands for. I use the fame method. F, what do friends and family say about you? This is a big one because let me tell you, typically the things that friends and family say about you, you totally undervalue. It's something that you are like, oh, okay, like my husband. My husband is the calmest man ever. It doesn't matter what's going on. It could be a fire outside, the baby could be screaming, but he's calm. And even when he's not um, okay with the events around him, he never yells, he doesn't get upset. He has extreme control over his emotions, which is why he's such a great manager and he's so good with leading people. So I've been telling him, and he's not a speaker, this should so be his topic, okay? So if you see him on the internet streets, let him know. Okay, I talk very well of him. So I think his topic would be maintaining peace during calamity, maintaining peace in a pandemic and what that looks like on a corporate level and what like what you need to do, what thoughts you need to have, what meditative thoughts you need to be having every day to maintain peace in a pandemic. Because everyone says he's nice. Everyone says he's so calm. Everyone says he's so in control of his emotions and everyone calls him wise. Like he, even when he was, we got married at 22 and 23 and people would like, always say like you have the you have the wisdom of a 65 year old assuming a 65 year old is just naturally wise right so they would always say this about him and that is something that he totally undervalues he's like oh well i mean whatever no one's gonna pay me for that but they do people literally pay people to come in and talk about controlling their emotions so what do your friends and family say about you this is typically soft skills okay so this is going to be something that is not a hard skill unless everyone says like okay you're really good at math but then you want to dig deeper what does that mean you're analytical you're able to solve problems those are going to be the things that you want to think about for this portion of it okay a is um who is the audience that can pay you who is the audience that can pay you so are you and I'll give you some examples of audiences <clears throat> that pay speakers. So you're looking at for-profit corporations, nonprofit um, organizations, associations. So that'll be like the National Associations of Realtors. But there is an association for everything. And then under nonprofit, you should put foundation. Those uh, foundations of all the nonprofits, foundations and really colleges and universities, Foundations and colleges and universities in the nonprofit space have the largest budgets. For-profit colleges, not so much. Of the colleges that have the biggest budgets, typically it's large state institutions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So typically it's large state institutions. Okay. So um, Candace just said, you just gave me my topic. Okay, great, great, great. <laughs> Um, those are going to be some uh, um, audiences that you want to think about. And I say this because there are some people that come to me that are total, um, just, you know, Mother Teresa's of the row, right? Really good people, bleeding hearts. So like, I want to go talk to inner city youth that can do nothing for me day in and day out. Okay, excellent. But who's the audience that's going to pay you to do those presentations? So if that's your goal with speaking, then you may need to look to having your speeches sponsored. So the audience is going to be um, a large corporation. I, I host the Speak Your Way to Cash podcast. Um, we interviewed a guy called Mr. Good Vibes. He has partnerships with Dave Investors, Burger King, et cetera. 
and they just want to get in front of students. They can't just go into the schools as easily as he can as a speaker. So they pay him and the schools get his speeches for free. So when we think about audience, it's like, okay, who's the audience that'll pay me? And who's the audience that I'll be speaking to? Because those are two different things. Or at least they can be. M is going to be monetization. 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 So monetization is going to be <clears throat> what are all the ways that you can monetize your speech? And this is going to look like products and services that you have to offer. So you want to write out what are all the products and services that you have to offer or that you can easily create that you can use to monetize your speech. So this may be ebooks if you don't have a physical book, your physical book if you already have a physical book, if you have um, coaching sessions that you offer, that may be something that you think about monetizing. If you are able to do an assessment of some sort, like we have the love assessment. So similar to like disc assessments and Colby assessments, we've created our own proprietary assessment that we um, go into companies and administer and talk to them about the results. And then we develop an entire plan for how we're gonna serve them based on their results on the love scale. Because love, of course, is our proprietary framework that we go into companies and teach. So we develop everything based on those proprietary frameworks. Our spinoff products are based on our proprietary frameworks. The other services that we offer are based on that. All, it's all based on what's proprietary to you. So you wanna think about that. What are all the ways you can monetize? Cause that's gonna also determine who you're speaking to. If your book is only for college students, then maybe you wanna develop your frameworks and leverage and everything based on that audience so that you are, um, you're really capturing all the work that you've already done. So think about that as well, um, monetization. And then E, and this really gets to the heart of Karen's question, when you're thinking about qualifying yourself, you're gonna wanna think about education and expertise. Some of us have degrees and I, I'm guilty of this, okay? We have degrees. <laughs> I got a degree in international business and I studied abroad in Brazil, the Dominican Republic, uh, Jordan. Literally, I studied water irrigation in Jordan in college. Then I went to law school and developed an entire course on Moroccan law and politics, along with some colleagues and I. So I have studied in Morocco, Jordan, Brazil, and the Dominican Republic. And I studied business in these places and developed coursework there and really spent significant amounts of time there. So months at a time, I'm in these other countries, but studying it for an entire semester and or year. And my major was international business. I don't even, I barely even talk to clients about that. But now that we're going into these embassies and pitching them on me training women in different countries um, who are women in leadership in different countries, that all comes up. So you may have some experiences in your background and some educational experiences in your background that you've never even thought about framing to put before a corporate audience to make yourself really a thought leader and an expert on some things, but you have to consider those things. One of the things we do in the uh, Speak Your Way to Cash Academy that I launched, that it literally starts, our cohort starts January 19th. One of the first activities is write out every single accomplishment that you have in your life. Every single accomplishment. Where have you worked? What were your sales numbers at your first sales job? How many, like literally, I realized this year that I have made over 20,000 sales calls across my career. I just added it up. I had a job where I did 120 sales calls every single day, five days a week, over 20,000 sales calls. Now, if you look at the resume, that may not jump out at you, but when you add up the actual contacts that you've made and you start to frame this stuff, you realize, okay, I have serious experience here. If you worked in retail, how many thousands of customers have you seen every single day? You've literally spoken with probably 20,000 customers if you worked in a high traffic retail store, even as a receptionist or a cashier. All of that customer data means that you know something about speaking to customers. You know something about de-escalating customer situations. And you're able to package that with the right expertise and coaching into a program that you could sell into a corporation based on real numbers, real data, and real expertise. What I think happens is if we don't readily value the expertise that we have, we instantly undervalue it. So yeah, maybe you were a cashier at CVS or Walgreens since you were 16 years old all the way to 22. That was like 
high school to college years. And you may think, oh, that wasn't a big job. I only made 12, 15 an hour. It's not a big deal. But when you start looking at how many customers you spoke to, how much revenue passed your hands, you have real experience and you know things based on that. You know how people act. You've learned how to read signals. You dealt with customers that were um, handy capable and not. You've probably dealt with customers that were verbal and nonverbal. You've probably dealt with people who had kids in the checkout line who were totally overwhelmed. You've offered a smile to people who never had gotten a smile before and never had good customer service. You've been able to get cursed out but still maintain your composure depending on your job. I worked in customer service, so I've seen some things. And all of that experience is experience that customers, is experience that corporations need because where you can come in at, as a consultant and say, hey, this is what it really takes to make customers feel valued. And I was on the front lines. That's not expertise and experience that they're getting. Typically, people approach it from the other end. Well, I was a CEO of Walgreens or I was the senior executive at CVS. But when you're in those ivory towers, you don't see it the same way as the person on the front line. So you don't want to undervalue any piece of your story. So that experience that you have, you want to, and this is why working with a coach is so important because you could come to me and say you work at CVS and I could pull all that out. But if you go to like your friends and say you work at CVS, they're like, well, when are you going to get another job? You know what I mean? <laughs> so you want to be really, really careful that you don't undervalue any of those experiences because that's going to be how you really give yourself credibility. And we'll talk about another way, which is press, um, to give yourself credibility as well. So the E in fame stands for education and experience. So education, what is your degree in? Whether you use it or not, you spent years studying a particular area of this planet, right? Was it sociology? Was it psychology? How do you take that or how do you present that and package that into your offer that you're gonna make to corporations so that they understand that you're the ideal choice? And that experience piece is what I talked about, all the jobs you've ever held and thinking strategically and critically about what were the numbers that you acquired in those jobs. That's gonna be really, really, really important. So the biggest myth associated with landing large corporate contracts is that you have to be stuffy and there's like this, um, there's this magical way that you're supposed to present your offer. Um, there's not. You literally can go to a company and, and when, when I say like stuffy, I mean that a lot of people don't sell into corporate because they think that if they sell into corporate, they won't necessarily know um, the words to say or they're afraid that someone's going to call them silly. And honestly, some people think that they aren't quote unquote educated enough to sell into corporate. What are these people going to do? And so here's the biggest myth associated with selling to corporate. You are not selling Coca-Cola. You're selling Sandy. And Sandy works a job at Coca-Cola. She is not this huge, monstrous, scary corporation, right? So you want to think about selling into corporate not as like, whoa, how could I ever land Pepsi? It's a billion dollar company. They've been around 25 plus years, hundreds of years. They're for, like, no, no, no. You want to think about it like, okay, what are the job titles that I need to approach? And how do I get this one person to believe in what I have to offer enough that they'll take me through the process of selling to a corporation. It literally only takes one employee at an organization to say, you know what, I would love to, I would love to have that here. That's all you need to start that process. Okay. So the biggest myth is like, it's some big scary corporation. And literally all they could say is no. And as long as you pitch in a way that is professional and with integrity, even if they say no now, it doesn't mean you can't come back later and make a sale. So don't get caught up in the fact that it's a big company and what are you going to do? No, 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 no. Do not get caught up in that. Okay, so I'm seeing some additional questions come through. Um, do you offer a template to reach out to those organizations slash institutions? I find that breaking the ice is the most challenging part. Yes. So we have um, in the Speak Your Way to Cash course, there are templates for selling into um, corporate. It's more so for those one-off engagements. And then people in the academy, I saw us attorney DeBarros is on here, they will get like a, a pitch template and a proposal template. Because really with the five and six figure offer, you may do an intro email, but you're really going to be sending a proposal. And that proposal is going to be um, the template that you'll want for that. But there is in our course, you can, um, I'll give you my number at the end. You can just text me and I can send you the information for the course. Um, do you think there's more success talking to soft skills like people, culture versus harder skill sets like operational methodologies, Lean Six Sigma, et cetera. So Six Sigma is something that's very popular. I do think that soft skills has their place though. And I think that it's easy for one, here's the thing. 
you're selling to Sandy, right? Sandy is our fix, fictional corporate gatekeeper. Um, Sandy may not understand Lean Six Sigma or uh, hardcore concepts. And so what Sandy understands is like love, peace, joy, happiness, all the things that she wants. So whatever you're selling, you want to connect based on the soft skills, but you may sell in a more robust program, but you may not, even though that's the end result that may be in the back end of what you offer them, you wanna make sure whatever you're selling in is repeatable and referable. So it has to be something that you can say like, hey, I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna tell, um, we're gonna do the currency of confidence program, and I'm gonna just help you all with your mindset, your beliefs and the actions that it takes to get to, to success, real simple. Currency of confidence, mindset, beliefs, actions. We're going to give you an MBA in confidence. She may not remember all the words I said, but currency of confidence, MBA, she's going to remember enough so that she can regurgitate it. What I think a lot of people have a problem with when it comes to selling is that most large companies are not making decisions in a silo. So they have to be able to repeat what you are selling. They have to be able to refer it and get excited about it enough that they'll take it through the process because essentially... You need to sell your stuff into this into companies as though you're asking this employee to do extra work on the weekend. When she woke up that morning, she was not thinking how to get you more money in your business. <laughs> so it has to be about her. Like she has to be so excited about it that she's okay sending the additional emails to the appropriate people to get the appropriate buy-in. She's okay having two or three more calls with you to get you set up as a vendor. She's okay doing all that because she's so excited about what you have to offer. If you're selling um, something that's more hard, uh, hard sell, like it's a hard skill rather, you want to just make sure that you present it in a way that's really easy. It's repeatable and it's referable. That's going to be the thing. Can they repeat it? Can they refer it? And the test will be Talk to your friends or who really don't really care about what you have to sell. Honestly, they, you want to sell it to them. And then the next day, like just talk, bring it up in conversation. The next day say, Hey, do you remember what I told you about yesterday? What was the name of that program? I told you if they can't remember it, you need another name. You need another way to present it. You want to make sure that it's repeatable and referable. Cause again, you don't want them saying, Hey, I got this leadership speaker, or I got this Six Sigma um, speaker. Or I got this disc assessment person that's going to come in. Cause they can Google that and price match. That's not what you want. When you're selling based on value, it can't be a price match thing. It really has to be the um, that that what you're selling is so important, so valuable, so intricate that you're the only you're the only choice. And the only way you get that is if you have a trademarkable process uh, or framework that you're basing your trainings upon that they can repeat and get to other people. Okay, so yes, no experience is wasted. I answered that question. I thought I thought, okay, if you're interested in speaking at a university or college, who should you contact? Okay, Meredith, awesome, great question. It it depends, it always depends, but typically you're gonna be looking at the um, student activities director, but it can also be the provost, dean of students, and the names of those, those positions vary. But if you're, and, and I have, the, the Speaker Ready Cash course talks all about selling into colleges, but in the academy, we really focus on those five and six figure offers. So at that point, even at a university, although the student activities director may be involved, they're typically going to be partnering with other departments to bring you in at that level, just because they don't want to use all of their budget on one vendor. And when you're selling into corporations or to colleges, you're a person, of course, but they're looking at it as like, okay, this is a vendor. I have a budget to spend with a variety of vendors. I don't want to use all my budget on one. So typically that's how that works. Who do you talk to and how do you identify if they have a budget? Great question. Great, great, great question. Okay. So let's talk about pricing and I'll answer that question about how do you identify if they have a budget? The bad news is you're going to have to get really good at spotting opportunities. Um, there's not a specific, um, there's not like a speaking circuit. There's not a speaking circuit. So there's not like a, um, all companies operate this one way. What I can say is based on my experience pitching 5,000 plus organizations, I've, been, I've gotten pretty good at identifying industries that are traditionally hiring for these types of contracts. So those large state universities that I talked about, they have a budget. It's not an issue of whether they do or don't, they do. It's an issue of, uh, you know, are they going to spend it with you? <laughs> or are they gonna spend it with the comedian that can come in virtually and make kids laugh or a variety of other people that they're typically using their student activities budget on. But colleges, large state colleges have a budget. They look at the, when you look at that student activity fee for colleges, that's what that goes towards, do student activities. So they have a budget. My background, 
thinking about your experiences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, any Illini on the call? Um, I actually was the director of cultural programming. And this was in 2000 and I don't even, like nine, I had a budget of $60,000, right? And I was the student that determined where all of that money went. Um, our overall budget was hundreds of thousands of dollars and it was students determining where that money went. So you, um, colleges have the budgets, right? They really do. It's just a matter of, will they spend it with you? Corporations have budgets, but typically each department has its own budget. But when you think about industries like the pharmaceutical industry right now, they are still getting money in the door. That Though the pandemic has impacted all industries, that industry is still thriving. So we really focus this year on serving that industry. Now, they had a travel budget. Pharmaceutical companies spend a lot of money on travel, but this year, there wasn't so much travel. So they were able to reallocate that budget to um, the services that we provide, like speaking and consulting. So you wanna think about it on an industry level based on your topic, that's how you're gonna identify it, but you're also gonna wanna do market research. So one of the things we're doing in the academy, the first quarter is market research. I have templates for reaching out to people with certain job titles and you actually getting them to give you 15 minutes of time because you wanna know the language. What, what are the words they're using now? Because the words they were using last year, not the same words they're using this year. A lot of people are banking on this, um, this uh, vaccine changing the game, whether or not it will. We don't know. We just, no one knows. No company knows. You know what I mean? But most companies are banking on that. So you want to know what are, they, what are they forecasting? What's most important to them? How are they dealing with uh, business uh, disruptors, which is what I would call the pandemic. It's a huge business disruptor. And we don't know whether or not it's going to go away or not. So are they fit, are they spending conservatively? And if they are, where are they spending? Because guess what? You still have to keep employee satisfaction up, but it's down right now because everything's on Zoom, everything's virtual, and people overall are just feeling fatigued. So you want to know what that language is like. But overall, um, you can also look at the stock market, okay? Pro tip, which company's stock is rising? Which companies have taken a huge hit? There's a direct correlation between industries that are hiring and thriving and the stock market. Where are, where are the numbers? And, and if you look at that from an industry level, and you're, you're either going to target based on your topic, like your topic is so specific that it can serve any industry, or you're going to be industry specific in the way that you target. And I like industry specific targeting because it's easier, it's clear, it's more concise. I can pull every pharmaceutical company in the world. I can pull who they're... Um, you know, chief people officers are or HR directors are, and I can develop a plan of attack. So you want to think through how you're going to do that. Um, but that said, you, it, it's not a one size fits all, which is why I think it involves some coaching with someone who's been doing it for a while. That way they can kind of tell you, no, 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 that's a sign they don't have a budget. Um, but don't be afraid to ask, like, don't be afraid to ask. And that's where market research really comes in. So I'm typically talking to <laughs> someone at the senior level of the organization. So I'm talking to someone on the board of directors or I'm talking to someone who's like director of HR or chief operations officer. Those are the people that are my clients for the most part. Sometimes it's the director of diversity, but a lot of times the companies that are bringing us in don't have um, a director of diversity or it's the director of a department. Because when you think about companies and you think about colleges, I think of it in terms of where's the money? And companies that are <clears throat> companies, co companies that are large enough to have directors of a variety of departments, each director will have its own budget. But that budget is just may not be as large as you need it to be. Do you think there's a market for faith-based incorporated with business strategy? Yeah, I think there's a market for that for sure. I just think that whenever you lead with faith-based, you're gonna limit it because no company wants to get a lawsuit. <laughs> and as a former employment lawyer, if you bring in a speaker that's like talking about one specific religion to the exclusion of others, it can cause problems. So the way that most people handle that is by talking about principles. Like I'm a, you know, full disclosure, I'm a Christian, right? So like love is a really strong principle of the Bible. So I do the love method of communication, but I don't say like, and in Matthew 10 and five, you know what I mean? Like we don't, <laughs> we don't ever go there, you know? Like we actually talk about the principles but we back it up with science. And most religions um, that have strong principles like you know, love, faith, um, even uh, resilience, though there are scientific, there's scientific data that can back that up and help you craft a really strong, strong presentation. So when you're thinking about pricing, one of the things that I would say is you do not want to, 
Someone says, thank you for this presentation. I'm very inspired to make this a reality. I love it. One of the things about pricing, guys, you do not have to start at the bottom of the market and work your way up. You could literally, your first time pitching a company could be with a six-figure offer. And I know that sounds crazy if you've never done it, but I'm telling you, that is what our clients do. And it saves them time and energy. And it also sets them up for success because unlike my first year in the speaking market, where a lot of coaches were like, just, you know, pitch thousands of people, hope for the best, charge two or $3,000 and be blessed if you get a hundred engagements, um, you can get two or three, right? And you can serve your clients over and over and over again and become a real thought partner with them versus a one-time vendor that does this one thing once a year. So that's kind of where you want to be. Um, the largest organizations hiring speakers right now, I personally think that is state colleges and universities, but it has to be relevant to what they're dealing right now, which is students being disengaged because everything's virtual. And then the pharmaceutical industry is still thriving. Commercial real estate um, has taken a huge hit, but foundations, the people who provide funding for nonprofits have huge professional development budgets and they are still hiring. And middle market companies that fuel a lot of the economy's growth are still hiring speakers. And they're really focused on how do I keep my employees happy? So keep that in mind. So I don't know, um, and we have time to do a huge hot seat, but if you just put your, put your topic, someone put their topic in the chat who is struggling to figure out what they want to um, talk about with their specific topic. Okay, someone put in financial literacy. All right. So financial literacy, if you are, and Sean, I don't know if you can actually come off of mute. Let's see. I don't know if that's possible. But if you can, uh, Sean, drop this in the chat. So financial literacy, what is it specifically about financial literacy? I think, Sean, if you raise your hand, I might be able to pull you off mute. Yeah, because I saw Sean's first. Okay, I see hands raised. There we go. Awesome. Okay, Sean, what about financial literacy are you interested in? Hey, friend. Um, I want to, I do have a nonprofit and financial literacy is something that I like to teach um, women about. So I was thinking about expanding that to um, under my nonprofit or either speaking to college students about, because I feel like I was never taught and a lot of people that I knew, that I know, was never taught about financial literacy in school. They weren't talking about how to budget. They weren't taught about credit. So I just don't know if that's something that would be a viable thing to teach, to speak about. Yeah, that's a really good question. Okay, great. So one of the things that I will say is there's a couple of different things that financial literacy implies. Organization is one of them. Um, and also um, vision planning. So I forget what you call it, like almost like vision boarding, but planning ahead. So organization, planning ahead. And those are all skills that you need to have really to have your finances in order. So in order to expand that out, one, I think the college market would be great because all of them, one, there's a couple of things. One, you can partner with banks to bring this presentation to colleges because college students are typically 18 years old and above. So right now, a lot of people aren't just going into banks to open accounts. So you could pitch banks on um, being your sponsor so that you're going into these colleges. So your actual client, the paying client would be the banks and you would go into these colleges and present a financial literacy workshop. You would pitch it to colleges as something that would help their students to become more successful, both in college and beyond, because these are life skills that they need. And right now, because we're in a pandemic, a lot of people are trying to budget like never before. So it may even be something that you can partner with banks to do in the community. I will say, though, for corporations, typically they're looking for someone who can come in to make their employees more productive for them so that the company's overall output can be higher. So financial literacy is a great perk. If you're going to sell it to companies, it needs to be as an employee bonus or employee benefit. And it may limit the amount the company is willing to invest in that because as we all know, companies are all about their bottom line. So if you can, if you can position this as something that'll help the company reach their bottom line, I could see it. But overall, the underlying things that you're teaching are going to be organization, planning ahead, the importance of vision, and all of that stuff is going to be things that either a corporation or 
a uh, college would actually need. So those are some things that I would for sure, for sure, for sure think about when it comes to the financial literacy topic. I would really look at partnerships. So I think that's really important. Um, Audra Richardson said mental load or avoiding burnout. That, those are definitely topics. We actually have a few clients. One does like the wealth of wellness, which is her trademarkable signature speech. And she's a fitness guru. So that's something that she talks about. She actually is a health and nutritional coach, but she talks about how food plays a role in your productivity at work and how the way that people eat can actually impact their focus and attention at work. So she's found a way to combine what she does on that side. We actually came up with that together. What she does on the health and fitness side to corporations. So that's definitely something that is um, interesting to them. And then Kevin is great. I want to tell you about him. He's actually someone who I work with in VIP day capacity. He's a pharmacist, but he talks all about owning your brilliance and helping people to get the most out of their, their brilliance. And brilliance, we came up with an acronym for what each of those uh, letters means that he's able to sell into different companies and corporations. And then Brittany, I talk about Brittany a lot. She's an educator. So there may be some educators on here. She talks about a lot of different topics, but productivity, fulfillment, joy, those are the areas that she's really helped predominantly women overcome. But when she goes into companies, so similar to what Sean was saying, she helps women on her B2C side, business to consumer side. But when she goes into companies, she makes sure that it's relevant to everyone because everyone can get a lot of value out of that. So let's talk about the paid methodology. So how do you actually sell this into companies? What are the components of selling that five and six figure offer, developing your authority? I And this is what we teach in the academy. This is the framework that we use to teach our clients. Press, landing those large media features is a game changer. We just had a client, um, Dominique Pritchett. She's on our podcast. You can listen to our story for free right now and hear about how she leveraged the press on that wellness topic. She just posted about how she's going to be in the New York Times. So you want to be able to land those media features. Um, we have uh, templates and all that stuff about how to do that. But press is a great way to either write op-eds or to go on LinkedIn today, write your own article and just share it far and wide. So whether it's earned media, meaning you're getting featured or own media, meaning you wrote it yourself, you definitely want to be leveraging and utilizing press to land those engagements. Then assemble. You want to have a variety of elements to your five and six figure proposal. We talked about a few of them. It could be coaching. It could be an assessment. It could be those one time trainings. It could be executive leadership trainings. It could be different trainings for the individual um, individual executives at the company or the board versus like employees at large. So you want to have the well-assembled offer. I find the only reason people are not landing these large engagements is because they don't have the language to sell it into corporate. If you have the language, you know the framework, you have someone you can bounce ideas off of, you're going to sell it because you won't have to worry about being embarrassed. And I know it sounds crazy that embarrassment is what's keeping people from making the most money they can in their business, but it's typically embarrassment. It's like, I don't want to be embarrassed. So I, I want to have the language to do this effectively. Then inviting. Most speakers I talk to are like, well, I asked 30 people and no one said anything. So I guess I don't have a good offer. And maybe it is the offer that's the problem. But you want to be consistently and systematically inviting new people to work with you and do business with you every single day. You cannot do it one time. You cannot do it two times. You can't do it 50 times. You need to be doing it every single day. So you have to have an invitation system. I say invite versus pitch because what you're doing essentially is pitching, but inviting them to like a situation like this, like you all are all on this webinar right now. I'll tell you about how to join the Academy, but I've already given you a lot of things that you can implement even if you never join the Academy, but, but you're here. It's not like me and 75,000 other coaches here. I invited you through the partnership with Smith AI to an experience. You can do the same thing for your corporate clients. Find a great partner that also serves the same base as you, like this, whatever the Smith AI equivalent for you may be. Like there may be an HR tech company that wants to target enterprise clients. You partner with them, you both promote to your audiences, you bring them to a webinar, you talk about your framework, and then you give them ways they can work with you. That is a great way to get people to trust you and understand your authority and get a feel for who you are. And then they can raise their hand to see if they want to work with you further. And then delivering. A lot of people focus on delivering the speech, but not a lot of people focus on delivering an amazing customer experience. What do your welcome gifts look like? What do your exit gifts look like? When do you get feedback? How do you get feedback? 
Do you know their birthday? Are you sending Christmas gifts? All of this is a very important part of how you're serving at a high level. So it's not just, oh, they give you a ton of money and you're rich. No, no, no. <laughs> you want to be delivering both an amazing product. So you want to have your workshops well presented. They need to look nice. You want all that. But then you also want to make sure you're delivering an exceptional customer experience, okay? So that's the two parts of delivery. Great speech, great product, but also really, really, really focus on what does that customer map look like? How do they go from contract signing to offboarding and what's happening at every single point of the process? We develop your customer map um, in the academy, but even if you don't work with me in the academy, just map it out on a piece of paper. What are those entry points? What are we doing? Am I sending... I cannot tell you how much money we spend with 1-800-Flowers. If I see that a client lost a family member, I'm sending flowers. If I see that it's their birthday, I'm sending flowers. Eventually we'll get creative. But right now I'm sending flowers. You know what I mean? Like just something to let people know. I'm thinking about you. I saw this happen. I care about it. And I want to be a part of your life experience. I don't want to just be somebody that you pay this one time to do this one thing. So you want to make sure that you have some process for that. Even handwritten notes. It doesn't have to be very expensive. Um, it could just be a handwritten note to show them that you're considering them. Because right now, if you can foster connectivity, you're going to win in business and in life. It's just good to be a good person, but you want to be deliberate about it. Because as much as we all care about each other, if we're not deliberate about making that care known, it just won't happen. We'll get caught up in our day-to-day -day lives. So what's next? You've listened to all this. You're interested. I'm going to answer some additional questions, but I did want to let you all know um, because someone asked me about the academy, how many cohorts do you have in your speaking academy each year? So it varies. Right now we'll probably have, I don't know, maybe two. Um, we start January 19th. It's not too late to apply. There is an application because I, one thing about me, I operate with high integrity. So I don't, in, I don't like let people just join the academy. You have to apply because I want to make sure that I actually can help you. If you're like, look, I want to talk about, you know, pigeon reproduction or something. I probably am not the right person because I don't know enough about that market to really make it a successful one for you. So I only accept people who I can actually help. So to apply, you just go to ashleynicolekirkwood.com slash apply, but I'll send out um, some resources and a follow-up email to you guys. And I'll also include the link to that there. You can also just text apply to me. This is actually my um, public text number. So I'm not on it all day, every day, but you can text me at this number. Um, text apply, I'll send you the application directly to your phone. And then you can also ask me questions directly with this number too. It's me responding. It's not gonna be like a robot or anything. After you give me permission to text you, I'll actually respond. It won't be like some random person. So don't, <laughs> it's, it'll actually be me. Um, after you'll get the automated message and then you can actually text back and forth. So this is why I actually like this platform because I'm, I'm all about connectivity now. I'm telling you guys, like you have to connect, okay? <laughs> that is the big thing now. Um, so yeah, you can text apply to 312-847-4590. We start on the 19th. You're not too late. Um, you'll also get some really cool things. Like I, I have some products that are not on the market. Um, they're not publicly available, but I came up with a speaker rated cash planner to keep us on track. Right now it's only available to people in the academy, but there is a customer map in there and some other things. So you can do that. And I would love to have you, obviously. But there's a few questions in the chat. So I am going to run through those. Are we good on time, Kelsey? Yeah, it looks like we um, ran a little bit over the hour. Uh, but I am recording for anyone uh, who just wants to um, check back in or has to get back to work or back to studying or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, so feel free to stick around. I think that we should stick around and answer questions for as long as you have Ashley. Um, but I will um, also send out a email after this um, to everybody who registered with a link to the uh, video. For the awesome. That's okay, perfect. So I'll do questions just for like 10 minutes or so. Um, yeah, so Taylor asked about the replay. Okay, great. So Kelsey will send that out. Um, and then I'll, I'll email you guys as well, because I, I actually will send you an email um, for those of you listening or watching the replay. Um, I will send an email with a link to a podcast episode that talks more about the corporate engagements. It's another hour long episode with me and Kamanzi Constable, who's also a genius at this stuff. And we talk more about some of the concepts that we covered here. And I think it'll be a really good uh, free resource that you all can listen to. And it's, it's like really good. It's like even where to find your first few uh, companies to pitch and all that types of stuff. So 
are you people doing the outreach directly or do you provide that service as a part of your program? That's a great question, Eve. Um, yeah, so people do the outreach directly. Now, the way that I teach my program is as though you have a team and like what to do if you have a team, what to do if you don't. So how to leverage technology and how to um, utilize a team. We also have resources that we give in the program like CRM tools that are low cost, CRM tools that cost more. Because we have people at all different levels who join the academy. Um, so that's not something that we do, it's something that you can do. And then I can tell you how you can leverage your team to do that. And we provide SOPs for it. So literally you should be able to take those SOPs, give them to a team member and then let them get started with um, sending out those pitches because you'll have templates that you'll just need to fill in a few of information for. Even down to when you're pitching podcasts, one of the things that we gave out is, or that we're giving out is, um, you know, if you outsource pitching, you're going to get a lot of responses and your team members are going to have to send your bio, your headshot, all that stuff. So we have a form that you're going to fill out and then you give it to the person who's pitching for you and they can even handle that follow-up stuff. Because honestly, the people in the program are super busy. They're law firm owners, they're accountants, they're engineers, they're doctors, they're PhDs, they're life coaches. So none of us are sitting around like, well, I got an extra 50 hours a week to try some stuff out. So we try to make the academy the fast track to being able to implement what we talk about. So I think a lot about that, especially as a new mom, like what would be the most easiest, like what's the, what would I need if I was starting this with as hectic as my life is right now? Okay, so that's that. Um, I'm seeing a lot of amazing topics. I want to pitch adopting agencies and con um, conventions. Okay, awesome. So you really want to make sure for everyone who's pitching that you have a virtual lens to your pitch. Like, and I can deliver this high powered speech virtually. I have the lighting set up, whatever you have to deliver an amazing virtual experience, that's going to be a value add that you want to do it. So Sean said, I can only imagine the cost. I hope you have civil payment plans or something. Let me pray. <laughs> Sean, that is the funniest comment. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it is an investment. I'm not going to lie. It's an investment to work with us, but you can text me and I'll tell you about all the options. After you apply though, you get to watch a, a two hour training where I go more in depth about what a proposal looks like, what a five and six figure proposal looks like. And all of that's complimentary. So even if you apply, you just watch that training, you get more data and information. It's super valuable. Um, Black maternal health, I've heard that topic before. I'd like to schedule one-on-one -on -one with you. Do you offer that service? We do have VIP days. They're super limited because time on one-on-one -on -one is like super, super limited. But feel free to text me and we can talk about that, Grace. Um, and will I get the chat? Because I feel like we may not be able to go through all these questions. Because what I can do um, is I yeah, can- Yeah, we can, we'll get the chat um, as a part of the webinar. And so if you okay. need to follow up later, feel free to do that. Yeah, because one thing I'll do, guys, when I get the chat is I'll look at those questions and I'll like in my email to you, just put like, you know, the question and the answer when we have more time, because I know that some people definitely have to get back to work. Um, this is really, really, really good. Would you apply the same approach you've shared for pitching corporations or not for profit organizations to the bidding process for federal, state or local government contracts? Um, in the sense that you know, I have a um, government sales person who works with our team. When you're pitching for government contracts, they put out RFPs that you have to follow very succinctly. Whereas on the corporate side, you're able to be a little more creative and craft the proposal to what you want to offer them or what you feel is best. For the government, you're gonna to wanna to give them exactly what they're looking for. All right, someone says, I'm interested in speaking my way to cash. The podcast would be great. Um, I've worked with Ashley in a small capacity and I'm taking some of her classes. It is amazing. I can't wait to, oh, that's so sweet. Oh my gosh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much. I did not pay her to do that, but I do appreciate that. So yeah, guys, I'll look at the chat later to answer more questions, but I so, so, so appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Kelsey. And just so you know, it may seem like we're running a huge operation, but it makes it so much easier to have someone on the phone so that we do not miss a lead. Because if a company called us today and we're like, hey, I want a corporate speaking contract, Smith AI and their receptionist would answer that call. I would not miss a beat. So it's really important that you have systems in place to um, handle the growth that you're expecting. And honestly, the investment for Smith AI is for the professionalism that in the image that they provide, the investment is nominal. Like you definitely wanna have someone who can answer the call. And I say that because as much as I love online business and I can have you text me and all this other stuff and have automations, 
Large corporations don't play that way. They want someone they can call, someone they can talk to. They wanna see your phone number. They wanna be able to reach somebody to know that it is all a legit operation. So you want to connect with Kelsey and the Smith AI team if you're not already to figure out how can I get receptionists on my team? I've, I've and, and then what I love is I started off on a smaller package and it just keeps growing as my business grows. So when I first started, I was able to do a package that was reasonably inexpensive. And then as more money came in and more calls came in, they were able to grow with us. And I love, love, love systems and people and packages and even like coaches that can grow with the size of your business. So I highly recommend them. I cannot thank them enough for bringing this information to you all. And what other like receptionist services bringing you all this information, okay? Not many, okay? So <laughs> definitely sign up for their, <laughs> their services. But this has been amazing. This has been amazing. So I really, really, really appreciate um, the time here. Thank you so much for joining us, Ashley. Uh, I can't even um, tell you how wonderful this information is. Uh, <laughs> other receptionist services just don't have people like Ashley, I guess, <laughs> who are willing to uh, give us their time and really just provide so much wonderful information. Again, I'll send out an email to everybody who registered um, with a link to the um, YouTube video of this uh, webinar. And then also um, I'll provide you guys with a, a code if you want to get started with Smith AI and some more information. Um, and thank you again so much. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their week.